Officer down! I repeat, Officer down! Welcome back to 1033. This is your host, Nathan Kapler. A podcast created for a first responder by a first responder. If you are not a first responder, you still are welcome. This podcast is aimed directly at trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is complex and often misunderstood. Our brave men and women who serve our communities often end up with behavioral and psychological issues as a result of experienced trauma from their careers. My goal is to share what I know, my personal experience with PTSD as a retired police officer, and continue to advocate for mental health while providing support to those still in their careers. This podcast is not a substitute for professional medical help, and I strongly suggest if you are in fact suffering, you seek out professional medical advice. Please join me on this episode as I continue to expose the reality of PTSD challenges. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. On last week's episode, we talked about PTSD, suicidal ideation, the topic of suicide, and the correlation and how this all blends into a world of pain and suffering and the why. I don't endorse suicide as an overall mechanism to deal with that pain and suffering, but having had gone through enough of it in my own life with post-traumatic stress disorder and the things that I saw as a police officer, I would be lying if I said I never suffered from anything like that. I didn't have any suicidal ideations. I didn't have moments where I thought too, even in my own journey, I don't want to be here anymore. I no longer want to experience this pain, this suffering. When you have seen that much pain and suffering because of your career, being a police officer, a first responder, or even seeing one significant event in your life that is filled with that trauma that can leave you in pain, if those intense feelings that come from that moment in time are not properly processed, they can become weights in your life. They can and they will drag you down. Due to the fact that I had a front row seat as a first responder to some of the pain and misery and experiences that I had been subjected to over the course of my career. In a twisted sense, I understand why first responders take their own lives. Being a first responder myself gave me that front row seat to experiencing some of the most significant things that I have ever experienced in my life. Moments where I had nearly lost my life. Moments where I almost had to take a life. Many high-speed pursuits. Many physical attacks on me. Most of which went unanswered in court. Seen my fair share of alcohol and drug dependency issues. Seen that layer of people in society that suffer the most. I also have been to multiple suicides as well. Some that had just taken place, possibly could have been prevented if I had been there moments earlier. Observed death and decay at various stages, and seen the tragedies that for some can cause us to go incredibly numb. Statistically speaking, some of the stats that are present that we can actually draw upon indicate that we are at an increased risk for suicide. That first responders are at a substantial risk of suicide. The pain and the suffering that can be there in that moment, no doubt can draw someone to that conclusion that they may actually be best off taking their own life because they no longer know how to deal with the pain and suffering. An added complexity built into that is post-traumatic stress disorder itself. The unfortunate part to this is the fact that the statistics behind this exact topic are largely unknown and not tracked. For example, we actually do not know the stats behind how many first responders have taken their own lives, whether actively engaged in duty or retired. We have no way to measure this problem, to see how big it is. The only way we can approach this is if we watch the news and we wait for those stories to come out, and a large portion of them never hit the news. If we are going to deal with this problem, things have to change. We need to start tracking these deaths to measure how big of a problem this is so that we can figure out how to address it 
and how much support is needed. This topic is often shrouded in secrecy for the many complex layers that are built within. A large portion of the families that have been impacted by these events, the loved ones that live on, often don't want those stories getting out. And I very much understand that. They would prefer to try and pick up the pieces of the puzzle that may never be complete and somehow heal the best way that they can and move on when they're ready without the immediate attention that often can come with these cases. The misconception that often hits people too. We hear many different versions or perspectives from those impacted by suicide of how could this person have been so selfish Were they not strong enough to step forward and ask for help? We had no idea that they were suffering. He seemed to have everything. She seemed to have it all. Happy, a family, a picture-perfect life. Which signals to me that because of these things that are said, the amount of shame that comes from this topic must be so intense that people don't even want to acknowledge that they have these thoughts when they are enduring some type of pain in your life. If you think for one second that you will go through your entire life without ever experiencing pain or suffering, think again. It will happen one day. And I can guarantee you the very real impact or chance that you may have these thoughts as well most likely will occur. And there's no shame in it. It is just a response to the pain and suffering that you are going through in that moment. So holding this belief or this feeling that shame is going to keep you from allowing it to come out, to be dealt with, don't let yourself ever be that person. If there is one thing that I have learned from my own journey is that there is no shame in any of this at all. I can look back and reflect on exactly why everything happened the way it did. I am grateful I stepped out and got the help that I needed, when I needed it most. And today's episode is going to be about something different. It's not about suicide. We're done with that. We're moving on to the next phase of my journey. When I stepped foot into a rehab facility in Nanaimo, for many of you that have been following along, you understand exactly how I ended up in rehab. I've talked a lot about my past experiences, the trauma that I've been through, and where this has led me to a point where I now recognize that I needed to go to rehab. One of the interesting things that comes from this belief, though, is that oftentimes when we hear the word rehab, we all already think that someone might be struggling with a substance abuse issue and they have to go and get help. While that is true, For first responders and the impacts that trauma has on them, there is also a trauma program designed for people, even in sobriety. The amount of first responders that suffer from significant PTSD issues, from trauma, pain and suffering, and have now cooked the body and mind from stress, display very similar symptoms to an alcoholic or someone who's addicted to and abusing substances. Police officers who are sober have to go to rehab facilities at some points in their career. Police officers who have addiction issues also go to rehab facilities as well at points in their career, sometimes more than once. And once again, there is no shame in that. In the beginning of your career, when you put your surge on or you first become a first responder, you are healthy and you go through a prolonged recruitment period where there are psychological assessments done on you, physical assessments, behavioral assessments, so many different assessments that your employer knows exactly who you are and how healthy you are. Everybody that goes in is healthy. So how do so many people end up in rehab and broken from the job? It's not because they're bad people or they make bad choices. It's because of the things they see and are a part of. It changes you. How could it not? That's why I say there's no shame in this. It's no different than being that frog in that pot of boiling water. When you first jump into the water, it's cold. 
But over the years of your service and the exposure to all of these different events, that water becomes warmer and warmer. And you don't even notice it until it's boiling. And you may not even jump out when it starts to boil. It may actually take somebody else around you to pull you out of the water. So did I change over the course of my career? Absolutely. Was I the same person 14 years later that I was going in? Absolutely not. Most of the good qualities that had made up myself, the caring, the compassion, the empathy, the sympathy, the ability to connect with others, all of that stuff had been eroded away. And that's what changes you. Acknowledging that I had changed so much in 2019 and I now needed help to get out of this this journey with medical cannabis and my severe, intense, post-traumatic stress that I was trying to Use the medical cannabis to deal with it. I had left my path, my original road, and was so far off of it, I didn't know how to come back. And I reached out to the Mounties and I said, enough is enough, I need to go and get help. Now in that moment, I did not want to confess that I was facing addiction. No one would want to tell your employer that. I knew the trauma had gotten me to this point. So I had mentioned to them that I wanted to go and deal with the trauma and go to this trauma program. I figured that if I had dealt with the trauma, that maybe I could deal with the addiction as well on my own and not have to actually address it or talk about it or acknowledge that it was there. The RCMP was supportive. They did move fairly quick. And it was in August of 2019 that I would walk into rehab in Nanaimo for the first time. I had no idea what to expect. I was beyond the point of being scared to go and deal with this because I knew that I had to. Fear wasn't even something that was with me at that point when I walked through those doors. I knew I had to face this. And the amount of courage and strength I had in that moment to walk through those doors definitely overwhelmed any fear that may have even tried to exist. In essence, I had hit my rock bottom around that time, and I knew if I didn't go to get help, things would get much worse. When I arrived, I was met with someone who was amazing. They were caring and compassionate, and they welcomed me. They treated me like a human being. I most likely walked through those doors completely disconnected and in a fragile state in that moment unable to say much or even connect with myself. But they took me in, and they showed me how to begin this process. When I first arrived to rehab, I was assessed by a few doctors initially in those first few moments. And I was assessed just for overall health. Where was I at in this moment? People come in in various states to these facility centers. Following that, I was shown my way to where I would stay for the following six weeks. And at this facility, there was two locations. We, as first responders, were actually housed in a separate building on the same property, but away from the other. We, as first responders, were housed in a separate building on the same property, but away from the rest of the general patients that were at rehab. There was maybe 15 of us that were coming in that week, and I showed up on a Monday. The rest kind of staggered in on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and eventually I got to meet a new batch of people that were here to get help, all from different backgrounds. Military, RCMP police, municipal police, firefighters, all first responders were there. And I had an opportunity to meet some of the most amazing men and women who have served their communities and in turn had lost their way. Where the other patients were housed, we were often up there for meals, for check-ins, for a few seminars, for group events. And I want to say at any point up there, there was probably 50 to 100 patients at any given time. Over the course of those six weeks, I would actually go on to meet many of them and develop actually very positive relationships with them. These were people who unfortunately had problems in life. And they came from all different types of backgrounds. Some were teachers and doctors and surgeons, hockey players, 
It didn't matter what you did for a job. All walks of life walked into that rehab center. And as they started to heal and grow from where they had been, they were some of the most beautiful people I have met in my life. Watching myself transition from where I was to where I am now and watching others in that rehab facility transition to where they were, to the person that they were when they were leaving, was a gift to watch. I have never seen so many people grow and get to such a place of hope for themselves. Now, the trauma program itself, there were two programs that ran where I was at for the first responder building. One was a trauma-based program, and one was a trauma-based program with addictions. Again, because of my state of denial, I was in the trauma program. And even though I maybe tried to hide the fact that I may have been facing addiction, I probably didn't do a very good job of it after all, looking back now. But alas, I dug my heels in and I stayed and I told myself that I didn't have an addiction issue. And I was here just to deal with my trauma. Now looking back, did that hinder my progress in an overall sense? Most likely it did, yes. But due to the fact that there's so much overlap between trauma and the addiction program, I was still basically going to all of the trauma and addiction program meetings and educational sessions, despite being there just for the trauma-based program. So I still did get a great opportunity to learn about addiction as well at the same time. And that for me was a bit of a seed that had been planted in that moment. And I would later nurture that and water that and allow that to grow. But for my time there, I stayed focused on the trauma that I had been through. Now detoxing from cannabis was not really that hard. What I needed though was to be removed from the environment or the ability to have access to it so that I could focus on my trauma and that I could heal it. And that was exactly what rehab in that moment had afforded myself. I can remember getting assigned a certain therapist and we had sat down and we had started talking about my life. And I had no idea where to begin. But when you start your journey there, you begin with your childhood. You've got to go back to day one. And I fought this because for so many times I sat there and I told my therapist, I'm here to deal with my trauma from policing. How is this childhood trauma stuff going to help? I don't think I have any. What I learned in that moment from him was that my trauma was much like the tip of the iceberg. The trauma that I had received from policing, yes, it was there. It was the tip of the iceberg above water. But where the root of the issue lay was below that water line. And that iceberg is much bigger underwater than it is above surface. And that too is where your childhood trauma exists. Deep down below. When I sat down to talk about my childhood trauma, I again met it with denial. I didn't actually believe that I had any. And when I was asked the question, what was your childhood like? I replied, normal. I was asked one question about fear. To recall the first time I had experienced fear in my life. And I was shocked because in that moment that I sat there in this belief that my childhood was fine, I had a distant memory that I had not thought of in years of when I was so young but met with such incredible fear and being scared. And I broke in that chair, and I began to weep, uncontrollably, as if I was reliving that moment right then and there. My therapist then turned to me once I was able to get my breathing under control, and said, Now how was your childhood? And that was the moment where I looked at my childhood differently. Now I'm not painting a picture of the people that are in my life as being bad people, or anyone around me for that matter. But I've come to learn that we actually all have childhood trauma. It's a very normal thing in life. Finding it, accepting it, and acknowledging it is very hard to do. In that moment, I looked at my childhood differently. With a different lens. I didn't try to hide from it or some of the things that had happened to me. 
And I finally allowed myself to see it and to feel it, to not run from it and to not put up a wall and push it away. A lot of us, if not all of us, have that. And again, there's no shame in that either. Acknowledging it, seeing it for what it is, and facing it, and allowing yourself to feel some of those hard feelings that may come from those spaces, is how we actually begin to heal. We would eventually go on in rehab to deal with the trauma that I had experienced while I was a police officer, and we would do many things around it to deal with the impact that it had on me. But I also spent a lot of time also dealing with a lot of the childhood issues that I had that I hadn't actually processed or dealt with properly. In a sense, the trauma that had later cooked me from policing was connected to the childhood trauma at the same time. Almost like this twisted, gnarled piece of yarn. And in order to untangle it, I had to start at the end of childhood trauma and slowly unwind it so that I could get to the end and then begin to deal with my policing trauma. The other gift that came from rehab is when I sat down with my therapist and told him that I wanted to deal with the trauma that was in my head, that had impacted me and made me unwell. My therapist reached behind him into a bookcase that he had in his office and grabbed one book, turned back to me and handed it over. And I looked down and it said, Waking the Tiger. It had a picture of two tigers on it by Peter Levine. It was a book about healing trauma. And I asked, what's this? And he replied, the trauma's not in your head. Where is it? It's in your body. The look I gave him in that moment probably showed exactly how much I understood that response. What do you mean? The trauma is actually stored in your body, not in your mind. Again, I was baffled. He said, Nate... Read the book. It'll make sense. Okay, I'll read this book. Now, the book itself is the first book I read in rehab. And it was the first thing that shifted my perspective of where my trauma sat. I believed it was in my head. And I was completely wrong. It was in my body. But I didn't understand why or how that could be. The book explains a story, the relationship between a tiger and a gazelle. It talks about how at one point the gazelle will be chased by the tiger. And the gazelle has a choice, to stand still or to run. Now what many of us may not see is that gazelle is actually hardwired in that moment through years of evolution to have its fight or flight response kick in. And it will get chemicals dumped into its body as it gets ready to flee. Now this animal is not a fight animal. It will run 100% of the time. So as the tiger chases the gazelle, that gazelle continues to get these chemicals dumped into its body and its body goes into overdrive. The heart is pumping furiously. Oxygen is being taken into the body through a different means now. The breathing rate has changed. The breathing rhythm has changed. The way the mind now works has shifted. Logic may go out of the window, and now it's more of an amygdala type of fear response. A very primitive way of thinking but necessary for the gazelle's survival. As those muscles are working at a rate that you couldn't replicate without a threat, a danger to this magnitude, that gazelle will attempt to get away and find safety. If the gazelle gets away successfully and does find safety, it does something absolutely incredible. It will find a spot It will stop. And it will shake for as long as it needs to shake to get all of that chemical out of the body, 
to release everything that was just dumped inside of itself to get it out. To bring the body back to a state of balance. It takes the time that it needs to process that entire event and to recover in that moment so it can go on back to its life of doing what it needs to do. Now, we as people do not do that. Most of us don't anyway. I never did. When we go through trauma, we have those same fight-or-flight systems kick in. We go through very similar experiences as the gazelle, met with choices of fight-or-flight, or freeze. The body kicks into a state of overdrive. Our breathing changes. The way the mind works changes. Our muscles give us that strength to do what we need to do. But what do we do when that event is over? Do we go and find our spot to recover? Do we talk about it? Do we shake? No, many of us push on. We move on to the next thing without actually stopping and processing what we had just been through and allowing our body to do what it needs to do in recovery. We don't talk about what we just went through. We don't address it. And if you're a first responder, some of us don't even have time to stop and talk about what we just went through. How did it impact us? What did we notice? What did we notice happen in our bodies? The emotion, the fear, being scared. Many times for first responders, we end up going to the next call and not having that time to decompress, to deal with what we had just been through. And that's a missed opportunity. That's a form of suppression. One that may be slightly out of our control, yes, But nonetheless, it's an impact to us. It's a layer of the onion that was just put down as a foundation. Most likely with more being added to the top of that. And we may not deal with those either. And did I have a critical incident debrief with the RCMP after all of the different traumatic events I had been through? Not one. Do I blame them? No. Should they have happened? Sure. Did they? They didn't. I had my opportunity later on to go back and heal all of this stuff that I had been through. Are things changing in the Mounties? I do believe so. I do believe it's taking those steps forward. I am hearing of some positive movement forward. When I read that book, it finally made sense to where my trauma was. My trauma was in my body, not in my mind. And I finally understood where the PTSD was. Yes, the flashbacks happen. They are in the mind. They are part of the memory. There are certain components that of the PTSD, they do exist in the mind. But for the most part, it is all in the body. And is all years of trauma, unresolved, unprocessed emotion and fight or flight responses from very significant events. You add in complexities from childhood trauma, which are very similar to what you may experience as a first responder, and you now have these same styles or same incidents happening to you at different stages in life. And they're going to impact your overall health. They're going to impact your behaviors, the way the mind works your coping strategies, the masks you wear, the ego. And for many, it can lead you down the path of addiction issues. This desire to self-soothe through an external means. That's very common. Now, my body at that stage needed to learn how to calm down. I needed to learn how to check in with myself and measure where am I? Where is the body today? What do I need to do to get it into a lower, more relaxed state? To deal with the anxiety. To deal with the tension or the stress. 
You see, I'd also lost my ability to check in with myself and figure out where I was. How overloaded was I with anxiety and stress? They teach you tools how to do that. How to raise awareness within yourself to do a self-assessment every single day. And how to start building new healthy patterns throughout the day so that you can help the body to calm down. And trust me, you feel it. When you finally find ease, when you've been running at 110 miles for your entire life, and running from all of your issues, when you start to slow down, it feels amazing. And there's other tricks and ways you can do this too. Proper nutrition, water intake, meditation, journaling, proper sleep cycles. For many of us, we do not self-care the way we should. We do not advocate for the things that we need in our lives. Take sleep, for example. Many of us lack sleep, and if you lack sleep for long enough, issues will come from that. Learning to set the body back up to a certain rhythm, circadian rhythm, so that it can have those deep, restful sleeps. I started to have them there, and I felt amazing for the first time in many years. I can remember the first night that I slept for 12 hours. I woke up the next day actually feeling refreshed, feeling energy, feeling like I had actually slept for the first time in almost 14 years. As a police officer, I had horrible sleep for years, horrible nightmares. The body couldn't rest and find ease during sleep. Meditation was something, too, that was brought in, and we did daily. And that, too, is a gift. Something that allowed me to help the body to relax. And to this day, I still do it. I believe it is one of the best life hacks in the world. I believe it is one of the best life hacks that we can do for ourselves. We also spent a lot of time, too, focused on art and creative therapy. Re-engaging the mind and using it in such a way that we challenged it through art, through painting, through crafts, and through song. And again, for me, I found it very weird at first to embrace this side of me because I'm not one to naturally go down that road. But in time, I saw the value to it as well. Being grounded, being slow and deliberate and having intention and allowing yourself the time to do what you want to do. I have very fond memories of rehab, oddly enough. I believe it saved my life in more ways than one. It challenged me in moments, in ways I had never been challenged before, simply to look within and finally address some of the things that I had been running from for years. But it also gave me the opportunity to step forward and heal. It was one of the best things I have ever done for myself. And anyone that reaches out to me to this day, I firmly recommend it. For now, we're going to close off this week's episode here. There's more I will share with you next week. If you find yourself in this space right now where the pain and suffering is too much, and going to rehab may be one of the things you are having to consider, you are definitely not alone. So many people go through this. And if you believe in yourself and hold hope and allow yourself to go, only then will you be able to recognize that it is the very thing that you needed most. As always, thank you for joining me on my journey. Have an incredible week. Much love. I hope you enjoyed this last episode. As we continue to grow, I would appreciate your support. Please consider subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. Leave a comment or a review and share this with anyone that you may know may benefit from what we are discussing. Have a great week, and as always, thank you for tuning in.